Good morning and welcome to this service of worship at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Clemson. I'm happy to have you with us for our, our Sunday morning service. Um, for a visitor, it's a little hard for us to know, but uh, we certainly hope that more people will be joining us online uh, until we are able once again to reopen. We also need to remind you that we depend on the financial support of our members and friends to pay the utilities and the mortgage and keep the place operating and keep it clean and uh, pay our staff during these difficult times. So if you are able uh, to continue paying your pledge or to make a contribution, please send it to us at 226 Pendleton Road and our administrator will make sure that it is collected and deposited. And again, thank you for your continuing financial support. Uh, we, Reverend Terry is not with us today. She's preaching in Montreal, Canada, and uh, there will be no Zoom conversation after the service, but it will resume next week. Uh, Terry also urges you to check out some of the Zoom events during the week, the bingo night, which is very popular, Tea with Terry, read the, the weekly, convent, weekly connection that comes out on Wednesdays, and the Monday musings. Uh, and also there's the meditation group. So to find out more, more about these events, check the weekly connection. We also encourage those who are on, the, on this, uh, listening to this to uh, invite others to send in their email address and be added to the mailing list for the weekly connection and the reminder for the Sunday service uh, so that they can join us as well. We have a reopening task force that's been working for several weeks and that the work of that force has now been turned over to the Council of Committees that is chaired by Susie Marcus. So if you have comments, concerns, or questions, we're going to try to keep people informed through the weekly connection, but also um, speak to anybody on the board or any committee chair, and they'll be happy to carry your message forward. I'd like to invite you to save the date for a farewell service for Terry, which will be held July 12th. Details will be forthcoming later. And important news, we now have an interim Christina Branham Martin, a recent graduate of Candler School of Theology at Emory University, a former director of religious education at Northwest near Atlanta, a veteran manager of several nonprofits and a lifelong UU. She will be joining us on September 1st. More details of that will also be forthcoming in the weekly connection. Our pulpit guest today is Carla Ulbricht, who is familiar to many of us, especially me. Carla grew up in Clemson, has a degree in classical guitar, and has written and performed many songs during her career as a singer, songwriter, and guitar teacher. For many weeks now, she has been doing a performance live on YouTube and Facebook on Friday evenings to connect with those who feel confined and disconnected by the pandemic. We welcome her to this service today to sing and speak on the theme of hope and resilience. Our opening words today are by Cynthia Landrum. Spirit of life and love, we gather together in different ways this morning, from computer screens, from telephones, from car radios. We gather reaching out across the wires, waving from a safe distance, to come together in religious community, from living room to front porch to car seat. We gather as we are able, ready to be of service to each other, to the world, ready to build the community of hope and of love. As we face the bright morning, we are apart, but we are together, offering our love, our commitment, our hopes, and our prayers in service to one another in this world. It is a new way, but an old way, that we come together and worship together. As I light the chalice of our faith, please join me in our affirmation. We gather together in a spirit of love, with justice as our guide. This is our chosen covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth with freedom, and to care for one another. On Monday, May 25th, we observe Memorial Day, remembering those who lost their lives in the service of our country. In 1915, during World War I, Canadian soldier, Lieutenant Colonel and medical doctor John McRae wrote the poem in Flanders Fields. 
In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. I'm grateful to Martha for sharing that powerful poem that reminds us eloquently and sadly of the sacrifice that so many people in so many ways throughout the years, the sacrifices people have made to protect our country, the people in other countries. Memorial Day is a holiday that marks the ultimate sacrifice of many people. And today we're very aware of the ways that people in our time are called on to give of themselves in profound and ultimately um, ways that may cost them their lives because they are caring for those who are ill. They are putting themselves at risk. In every age, there are those who see service for the highest good as their calling. There are also people who are vulnerable who lose their lives. And today, as we consider those we call heroes in our society right now, we're also aware that many of those people who have jobs that are heroic for us are jobs that they must carry out for their families to survive, uh, for them to make ends meet. And so today, as we share all that's in our hearts, our joys and our sorrows, let us consider ways that we too give back to make our community, our family, our world a more loving and compassionate and caring place. And so I invite us to take just a few moments to hold in our hearts those who offer generously to us of their lives. And may we consider ways that we might give to others, ways that we might not have considered before the pandemic. Let us also hold up in our hearts those who are our heroes, who have gone before us and been role models for us. Certainly our young people who are now graduates are ones who may see us as role models and mentors and heroes. And so with humility, we hold in our hearts and minds ways that we can make a difference in the world. So let us hold this in our thoughts for a few moments of silence.
spirit of life and love, we hold up today our gratitude for all those who give of their lives, their creativity, their time, their energy to make the world a better place. We know that there are days when we lose track of the hours, weeks when we lose track of the days. And yet, we also need to realize that we need to be gentle with ourselves as we reformulate what our lives may be like in the near future. We hold up today all those who are struggling in mind, body, or spirit. May they find healing and wholeness as is their lot. We give thanks for the beauty of the earth, for the ever spending wonder and mystery of the earth and all her creatures. May we open our eyes to the wonder and mystery that is all around us. And remember that we are, even in times of uncertainty and chaos, that we are grounded in Mother Earth. That we still maintain our most prized possession, our breath. We give thanks for family and friends and for this community. And in that spirit, we ask that all beings be free from harm, all beings be at peace. I mean.
is it? And how do you find it when things are really bleak? And how do you hang on to it when the situation is global and overwhelming? Hope is not just staying distracted or turning away and denying real problems. Hope is not simply optimism. Hope is more than a concept or an emotion. Like love, hope is a verb. It is a choice we make. Anyone who's had a long friendship, a sibling, a parent, a child, a spouse, any relationship of any length, knows that love is more than a feeling. It is a choice. We choose to love someone, even when they are annoying or do things we strongly disagree with. It's easy to love someone when everything is going along great. But when times are tough, love becomes a choice. And so it is with hope. It's easy to hope for good things when things have been going along smoothly. But when things are challenging, when we need hope the most, if we want to have hope, we have to actively choose it. It doesn't fall on us from out of the sky. It is a choice to persist and to work towards the outcome that we want. Sometimes, despite the odds. If I'm going to talk to you about hope, I have to talk to you a little about feeling hopeless because I have felt hopeless. I am a survivor of lupus, kidney failure, congestive heart failure, and two strokes. And I came out of that dark place using humor, creativity, persistence, and more than a little help from my friends. It was a fight, but most of all, I chose hope. This pandemic is not my first rodeo. I've had some practice at facing a scary future. I'd like to read to you a little short little essay from a book that I wrote about surviving and keeping your sense of humor and hope intact. What I learned by being a lousy athlete. Helen Keller said, although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. I've always been a below average athlete. I was often picked last at recess and generally had to work really hard to be even average at any sport. But the great thing about doing things that you're not very good at is that it offers a great opportunity to learn about self mastery, humility, persistence, and other life lessons. The first and only time I ever went mountain biking, the trail was muddy and very narrow with a steep drop off on one side. After falling off the bike once, all I could think about was falling off the bike again. There were many obstacles in the path, tree roots and rocks. I'd see them coming and I'd stare at them, just terrified of falling off the bike. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened about 12 times. Finally, I got off the bike and walked the rest of the trail. Later that year, I went on a ski trip with some friends. Maybe I thought winter would be less hazardous than summer, or maybe I just forgot how uncoordinated I am. Whenever I started moving too fast on the skis, my strategy was to purposely fall over so I could stop. And that was working fine until I saw the snow machine, which was cranking out tons of icy stuff, and I thought, ooh, let me land anywhere except there. So of course, staring at the snow machine, I was drawn to it like a moth to a flame, like deer in headlights, like flies are drawn to, well, you know what flies are drawn to. 
Anyway, I fell right in front of it and got plastered in snow and ice. What I learned from all this was the importance of focusing on where you want to go rather than where you're afraid you might end up. If I were to look for openings instead of obstacles, I would have biked and skied through the open spaces instead of ramming right into the obstacles. Fear is just faith in reverse. Strong belief in a bad outcome rather than a good one. After I had a couple of strokes, I got an opportunity to put this belief into action. I had lost the ability to play the guitar. Something I've done all my life is play the guitar. But I refused to accept that I might never play again. Instead of even allowing that thought to take hold, I focused instead on where I wanted to go. I wanted to be able to play the guitar as well as I ever did. Once in a while, the thought, what if I never play again, would enter my head and I would reject it. I refused to even entertain that what if, because that was my snow machine at the bottom of the hill, exactly where I did not want to end up. So every time such a thought would enter my head, I'd say, I am going to play as well as I ever did, maybe even better, and I would picture it. Meanwhile, the process of getting to where I wanted to be was slow, but if it were easy, I wouldn't need to have hope. Attempting to play the guitar was extremely painful because of the nerve pain. Just touching the strings felt like needles were being stuck into my fingertips. I tried gluing corn pads on my fingertips and using those rubber tips that cashiers put on their fingers, and it sort of worked, but because of the stroke, my left hand was too weak to apply enough pressure to get the notes to sound good. So I looked for an opening. I've taught little kids with no hand strength at all to play the guitar. It can be done. You just have to get a friendly enough instrument. So I went on eBay and I bought myself a ukulele for eight bucks. The ukulele has finger-friendly nylon strings and they require a lot less left hand strength to get good notes. And it worked. I was making music again. I later graduated to a larger ukulele and eventually I regained my guitar playing completely, just as I had pictured. I'm still a lousy athlete, but I don't really work at that. This story is a story of hope. And it's on focusing on where you want to go, not on where you are afraid you might end up. It's about choosing hope. I learned a great deal by going through that dark place and by being told by doctors and other well-meaning people to just settle and accept a lower quality of life. And I refused to accept that outcome. Deepak Chopra once said to those who have been given very bad medical news, this great piece of advice, accept the diagnosis, but not the prognosis. Accept the diagnosis, but not the prognosis. What I believe he is saying is yes, acknowledge the problem so that you can address it, but also choose hope. Denying a problem will only let it grow, but we don't have to accept the worst case scenario as being inevitable. Doctors are trained to give the worst case scenarios in our culture, but let's remember doctors in this culture only see sick people most of the time. People who are healthy and thriving don't go to the doctor much, if at all. So doctors, being human beings, are influenced by both their training that tells them to prepare patients for the worst and by their experience, which puts the sickest people in front of them most of the time. There are people who beat the odds and they go on and get better and go on to live full lives. But the doctors don't see much of them. So their mental data is skewed towards the negative. And the same can be said of our news media. They focus on the negative, the outrageous, the stories that will keep people engaged. Good people are doing wonderful things in their community all day long, but they aren't often making the headlines. And this is why it's super important to be mindful of how much and what kind of media we consume 
in a day. I limit my own news intake to one hour a day. You can be informed without being overloaded. By not saturating myself with bad news, this is another way I choose hope. One of my most powerful tools in maintaining hope when I was the sickest and weakest was the daily action I took towards my recovery. I got my cane, put on my compression hose, and started walking. At first, my goal was just to make it to the stop sign and back. I went a little further every day. I kept a journal and I tracked my progress. And I didn't know it until later, but at least one neighbor was watching and told me that they were very inspired by watching me get out and get stronger every day. You never know who you're affecting by your positive choices. Taking meaningful action every day towards building a better world right where we live is choosing hope. Whether it's volunteering, donating, running for office, or writing postcards to voters, or sewing masks for healthcare workers and friends, we can make a difference every day, no matter how small. Working towards the future we want to see, one where people care about and take care of each other, is another way we can choose hope. Now it's important to note that I did not recover all on my own. I had to learn to ask for help and to accept it. I had to learn to reach out to people for a ride to the doctor or a get together. I had friends who I got together with to play Scrabble, write songs, and laugh. I learned I cannot expect people to read my mind and figure out what I need, even if I think it's glaringly obvious. It's okay to sometimes need help. And now that I'm in a position to help others, I can pay it forward. Part of making sure we don't become a burden to others is to reach out and ask for help and get our needs met before our needs become a crisis. Asking for help that you need is choosing to believe that things can get better with a little help. And again, it's a way of choosing hope. Another thing that has helped me over the years is the serenity prayer. If you had to choose just one prayer this might be the best one you could find. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Having prayed this prayer many times, I came to realize through the repetition that really the only thing I can change and that I have any control over is myself. But that is the most powerful thing in my universe. I can't get away from myself. So I may as well make the inside of my head a good place to be by choosing hope. Now, those of you who know me, you know I am not going to talk about hope without talking about the power of humor and laughter. Yes, this is a serious time with serious problems, but so was having a stroke kidney failure and congestive heart failure, and so was the Holocaust, and so was the depression, and so was the Spanish flu. And during these dark times, every time, there was always present the release and relief of laughter. And I'd like to share with you another short chapter, very short chapter from my book about this. I was in the hospital at one point and for some reason, not enjoying myself. Maybe it was the needles. Maybe it was the rubber gloves. Maybe it was the rubber food. All I know is there's a reason the windows don't open. How else do they keep you from escaping? About day three of my incarceration, a ray of hope. Sarah Lynn, my bubbliest, silliest friend, came to cheer me up. She jumped from topic to topic, then got to griping about maxi pads. I chimed in, complaining about how they always stick to everything except what they're supposed to. Next thing you know, I'm writing lyrics about maxi pads on a paper napkin. I felt like me again, not just patient 2946065 in bed 31A with diagnoses X, Y, and Z. I'll always be grateful to Sarah Lynn for that visit. She not only cheered me up, she brought back my sense of humor. 
spurred on by our marvelous maxi pad song creation i started writing ridiculous songs about everything the more humiliating the better after all comedy equals pain plus distance so the more painful it was the more potentially funny by falling apart physically i had haplessly stumbled into a well of comedy gold for hours every day i wrote i wrote about drug side effects racing to the bathroom even being patient 2946065 in the indigent ward. If it was humiliating or painful, I tried to find the humor in it. Laughter provides pain relief, lowers blood pressure, boosts the immune system, even works as exercise, perhaps the only exercise you can get when you're hobbling around with a cane. Just as importantly, it can provide perspective and give you your power back. If you've ever been to a comedy club, you know the funny person in the room is the one with all the power. She can speak the truth and she can make people listen to her. It also changed the way I looked at and felt about what was happening to me. I started seeing the world through laugh-colored lenses. Once I stepped back and saw the absurdity of my situation, I really had to say, how can you not laugh at a time like this? This is the power of humor and the power of pattern interrupt. The humor and friendship broke my pattern of hopelessness. And this, my visit from Sarah Lynn, was the moment that I chose hope. The sound of hearty laughter is joyful and hopeful. Finding laughter is another way that we can choose hope. So what is hope? I submit to you that hope is a choice a choice we can make at any given moment and that we can choose over and over and a choice that we can make individually and as a community, a choice to believe in and work towards a brighter tomorrow. Let's choose hope.
benediction. By the words of Norman Mailer. Norman Naylor. Our eyes and minds turn now toward the ordinary, leaving this gathering made sacred by our presence. Take with you at least some seed of understanding, hope, and courage, and drop it into the confusion of the world. Nourish the seed that it may grow as a tree of life, giving shelter to the weary and hope to the despairing. Be yourself a branch of the tree. As I extinguish the chalice, take the light with you, carry the light, share the light, be the light. Blessed be.